The agenda this week consider the foreign affairs landscape as this new year begins and scan for signs of political extremism in Canadian politics. The agenda's week in review begins with a panel our Ontario Hub's editor just mentioned on the province's crisis triage protocols. The bioethics table, I think at no point really said that they felt that the that the the protocol that the document that we produced was uh, un unjustifiably discriminatory. Um, what we are trying to do is that we have a number of principles and, and uh, that we're trying to sort of balance here, right? That and broadly speaking, it's the desire to uh, to save as many lives as possible, but also to be very procedurally fair and and try to make sure that we're not, you know, un, uh, you know, disproportionately affecting one population or another. And as you're trying to sort of uh, defend human rights but also protect human lives, trying to find the way to best balance that is 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 hard. There's no one right answer. What we're talking about, and this goes back to what Professor Tecklang said and a little bit about what Dr. Downer said, about this balance between ethical uh, principles and the human rights framework. Um, and they've been equated from the very beginning uh, within this triage protocol. And that's problematic for several reasons. The first one is ethical principles are just that. They're principles. The human rights framework that we have are quasi-constitutional rights that are bestowed upon all of us. So you shouldn't be drafting a triage protocol to answer questions like the one you just posed by looking at ethical principles. You should be looking at a human rights framework. Second, the um, ethical principles that do guide this document are, some of them, in and themselves, discriminatory. By way of examples, utilitarianism, so which was mentioned at the top of the program and has also been mentioned by both Dr. Downer and Professor Shecklank. Utilitarianism talks about the maximum benefit of good for the maximum number of people. The problem is that when we look at this, persons with disabilities hardly ever comprise that maximum group of people that have received that benefit. So the ends justifies the means, which pretty much is utilitarianism, will always be discriminatory to persons with disabilities. But if you don't use so that to, philosophy, what yeah. should you use? The human rights framework. And the human rights framework talks about A, the duty to accommodate, and B, up to the point of undue hardship. It's not, it's not this, um, you know, idealistic idea of fairness, it's substantive fairness as, as set out in section 15 of the charter. So to dilute or to equate uh, ethical uh, principles with human rights framework is to dilute a very robust system. And just one more point on that, Steve, mm -hmm. to say that um, we just don't have time, we're in a pandemic, we need to be efficient. This is the type of scenario where human rights matter the most. Human rights aren't triggered when things are easy and people are living a happy life. Human rights are especially triggered in these most dire of times. And we can't trample over them for the sake of efficiency and, uh, and by trampling them by putting in ethical principles as taking primacy over human rights. Udo, I think that's appropriate. Okay, Udo Shuklin, can I get your view on whether we should take a, a more human rights based lens as we look at this issue versus a more philosophically utilitarian lens on this? What's your view? Well, I'm, I'm biased here. Yeah, I'm a utilitarian, so I do care about outcomes. And that's the nature of healthcare systems. Healthcare systems always try to maximize human well-being. Um, the, 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 I have issues with the, the human rights argument because the truth is uh, none of these charter rights are absolute. They can all be overridden, um, provided we have a, a good justification for that. So, so what the, the, the previous speaker has just done, basically, uh, she has hidden behind a human rights rhetoric, but she dodged a question. And the question remains, um, if you have somebody who is um, in a hospital setting, and, and I worked many years ago in South Africa, so I've actually seen this as a, as a clinical ethics person, like 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 I was on, on the bedside, um, and you find yourself in a situation that there's a patient there that is on a ventilator, uh, has not a really good, good outlook in terms of survival, and there's somebody else who needs access to that ventilator. Um, and you know that this person with a much higher probability will be able to leave that hospital. Are you then going to, as the previous speaker has just done, no, uh, we can't do this and we must not do this and outcomes apparently don't matter. It's all about rights. Um, are you really then saying, okay, we stand by, we wait for this uh, person who could have left the hospital to die um, and the other person is also really going to die, but we certainly will not wean that person off the ventilator. Suffice it to say in South Africa, of course they have weaned that person off the ventilator in order to save this other life.
David Lepofsky, you want to weigh in? Dr. Danner and more significantly, Professor Shuckley may give you ideas from the point of view of bioethics. I'm sorry, but we live in a country that's governed by law and the rule of law. And some of what Dr. Shuckley just took as utterly acceptable would, I think, need to be explained. Someone need to explain to me why it is not culpable homicide under our criminal code. And uh, you, you can't... It, even underlying all of this discussion has been even this, this implicit premise that somehow the government can send a memo to hospitals deciding who lives and who dies without any proper legal authority. Now, the, the bioethics table uh, in its most recent writing has suggested uh, a, a greater recognition that we need to have a legal support, but I'm telling you categorically, any doctor who does what, doctor, what uh, Professor Shuckling just said uh, without legal authority, uh, better be consulting uh, a lawyer and fast. John, to you first, to what extent do you think that the anger we saw in Washington last week exists here in Canada? Well, it is a truism that everything that happens in the United States eventually happens in Canada and to a lesser degree. So it is probably true that um, the kinds of resentments, the, the really unfortunate and regrettable nativist resentments, the resentments of the rural towards the urban, um, the, the cultural resentments that fired Trumpism uh, are here in Canada as well. It's probably also true that thanks to social media, the, the transfer across the border of the tensions between progressives and conservatives um, the, the rendering of that debate from I disagree with you to you are illegitimate in my eyes um, is going to happen here faster uh, than it might have happened in the past. My deep, profound hope, of course, is that this is a much more stable society, a much more consensual society, a society that still retains fundamental levels of trust in its institutions, and that whatever stress we receive, we will be able to endure and overcome but we're going to have some of it. There's no question about that. You see it already on the social media feeds uh, if you spend, as I do, far too much time on Twitter. Well, this is not an academic discussion for one of our guests today because Supriya Devetti uh, left her talk radio position not too long ago uh, because some of the stuff that she was seeing, uh, she felt she wasn't getting very much backup from the managers of the place uh, where she worked. Supriya, I wonder if you could fill us in on, to the extent that you can talk about this, um, Fill us in with some of the details, if you would. Well, I think it really started to manifest itself in the uh, aftermath of the Quebec City mosque shooting, where you we, we all sort of got into this national debate over whether or not the House should pass a non-binding parliamentary motion condemning Islamophobia. And there was a large amount of misinformation and disinformation that was being put on the airwaves, um, not just on you know the talk radio station that I was on, but really across um, the country in terms of tabloid print and talk radio in particular. And I would notice, for example, whenever my show did a fact-based piece on the Islamophobia motion um, and some of the other shows, you know, were trafficking in some of that myths and disinformation that I was referring to, I would see a direct correlation in terms of the kinds of things um, that would end up in my inbox and just the sheer volume of it. And for me, it became sort of this constant cycle that whenever there was something in the news cycle that had to do with immigration, that had to do with um, visible minorities, that had to do, you know, with race more generally, I would start to see an uptick in hate. And I don't think there was, you know, my contention is I don't think there was enough necessarily done to try and curb some of the myths and, and disinformation um, that was being put on the airwaves. Now, you had a white male co-host, yes? I did. I had two um, co-hosts um, that were both white and male. Did they get the same kind of stuff? I mean, they definitely got it, um, but I don't think they got the same in terms of volume and in terms of content. Um, Matt Gurney, my, my first co-host, um, described it as, it would be like, oh man, you suck. Whereas I would get something like, you suck, you bleep stained C word and I'm going to rape you. So very different in terms of the content. You got that? Oh, regular, regularly, yeah. 
Okay, Barbara, let me bring you into this conversation here. Uh, while the events that were taking place uh, at the doors of the U.S. Capitol were happening, uh, we had our own little Made in Ontario uh, event take place in the streets of Toronto as well. Uh, there was a caravan of, um, well, there were a bunch of pickup trucks driving around downtown Toronto with lots of pro-Trump flags and pro-Trump slogans. And I wonder what you thought about that when you heard about it. Well, I guess I wasn't surprised, and I should say it wasn't only Toronto either. There were uh, similar protests, uh, not the caravan so much as, uh, you know, gatherings of individuals in half a dozen cities across the country. Uh, and we know that there has been support for Trump since, uh, you know, he, he first ran in 2015, in fact, you know, his campaign. Uh, and so, you know, they were Trumps for Canadian, for, uh, sorry, Canadians for Trump. Uh, that uh, emerged immediately after uh, he began to run, and and they're still active, and that's certainly what we've seen. Um, and there is, you know, sort of sympathy for uh, Trump and his plight, uh, as they describe it, uh, but also so for some of the other ideologies uh, that support the, uh, the the patriots as they frame themselves uh, in Washington last week. So we do see sort of an anti-authority movement in Canada as well. I have to reject the idea that China is interested in cooperating with us. And when I say China, I mean principally the, the, the Communist Party in charge of it, not the people. What we've seen in China is um, a project in lifetime rule through President Xi Jinping, in which it would see the Middle Kingdom, China, uh, rise and replace the international order of the post-war era. I think that what Beijing sees when it looks around the world is a collection of half hegemonies that feed its own political, military, and economic growth, and that it sees itself in a position to build a new system to rival that of the West. And so I think that China has replaced Russia as the West's principal rival. In many ways, it's turned Russia into a gas station supplying its own energy interests, uh, and that we need to be very lucid and very clear about the threats that China poses to the world order. Peggy, rival or enemy? A uh, rival, absolutely. And I think that it's time to really call out this conflation of Chinese internal authoritarianism with external aggression. It's, um, it has uh, its, its defense strategy disavows um, uh, defense superiority, hegemony, and in, in, in straight uh, defense terms, I mean, China has, 200, has about 320 nuclear weapons, United States warheads, the United States has around uh, 5,000. Uh, United States' defense budget dwarfs China's. It's bigger than the next, uh, the next um, 10 countries combined, including China. United States has has 800 military bases around the world encircling China. China has one foreign base, naval base, tiny naval base in Djibouti. The, let's look at the actions. Let's look at the capacity of the country. Let's look at the stated intentions. China has a no first use nuclear nuclear policy. And I think that this hyping, this hyping of the China threat, when China is behaving uh, fundamentally like a great power, um, is 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 you know serves the interests of the um, of the of the defense lobby, but ill serves a globe that where uh, engagement on climate change and on health, to name two, and there has been good cooperation on health in spite of all the hype, are 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 global imperatives. Those are the global imperatives. Well, okay, let me, uh, I'm going to set up Shuvaloy to come back at you here because I saw him shaking his head in the midst of that answer. But the fact that they're holding two of our people hostage and share very few of our values uh, may have something to do with that. Shuvaloy, you want to come back at what you just heard? Uh, I think that the understanding of threats uh, probably requires a bit of an update. I mean, we've seen China be a belligerent on the Indo-Chinese border. We've seen China be a belligerent in the South China Sea. We've seen China use informal fishing vessels to harass the Australians. We've seen China use and weaponize commerce to harass the Australians. Their oppression of the Xinjiang minorities of the Uyghurs, Muslims in their Northwest province. 
We've seen China not cooperate on health in the World Health Organization. There's been no evidence at all that China is actually acting as a great power that would be a partner of the West in our shared mutual interests. If anything, we've seen China become uh, a belligerent geopolitical rival at the expense of Canadians like Michael Spavor and Michael, and Michael Kobrig, um, at the expense of 200,000 Canadians who are in Hong Kong. I do not believe that there is any uh, remote equivalence between American power and uh, China's asymmetric power projection. And I think that when we think of Canada's role in it, we're not caught between China and the United States. We are clearly uh, in partnership with the United States and other democracies around the world. And we should make those partnerships more accessible to new partners like India, Japan, and others. James Steinberg, where are you on China's alleged hegemonic interests? Well, I don't know if it's hegemonic, but I certainly see it as a, as a great power that, it, that doesn't hesitate to coerce others when it can to get its way. And I think that's the most troubling thing about the evolution of Chinese foreign and international policy is that basically the Chinese have decided that they're going to, they're going to get their way whenever way they can. And if they can get it through coercion and intimidation, they will do that. And only when they find that, that they can't get it that way do they tend to turn to trying to cooperate uh, with others. That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.